Hello and welcome to the Connecticut Women's Consortium webinar, Social Work Title Protection. We're joined today by the leaders of NASWCT, Michelle Kenefick, Board President, and Steve Wansick-Karp, Executive Director. They'll be discussing social work title protection. Michelle and Steve, if you're ready, the floor is all yours. Hi, good morning. This is Michelle Kenefick. We're so happy that you are joining us, and I wanted to just do a little bit more of an introduction of Steve uh, Karp, who I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. Um, but I, I wanted to first just say thank you to Steve for putting this together and really spearheading um, our work toward achieving title protection for social workers in Connecticut. Um, it's something that Steve is passionate about and has been. Um, and so Steve, as you know, um, is the executive director for NASW Connecticut, and he has been in that position since 1989 um, with a brief um, departure to the New York State chapter and then has been with us again um, uh, since then. So um, Steve works tirelessly, as you guys know, to make sure that social workers in Connecticut um, have the best protection and is a tireless advocate for us as well as the people that we serve. So with much, much gratitude, I will turn it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Michelle. So I'm Steve Wansikarp, and I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of history about this issue because this is something that we have worked on on and off and talked to folks on and off for about 25 years, I would say. Um, NESW has never actually introduced a bill like we're introducing this year, which is a straight title protection bill. We did at one point introduce a bill that would only have affected state employees, and that bill would have said that the state of Connecticut would have to call those social workers who had social work degrees, they'd have to use the title of social worker, and they'd have to come up with a different title for those workers who did not have a social work degree. And there's a lot of different titles that, you know, can be used, case worker, protective service worker, case manager, human services worker, and so forth. Uh, that bill ran into a lot of difficulty. Um, first of all, the state employee union, um, American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, uh, took a very strong stand against the bill because many, probably most of their members in the social worker series for the state of Connecticut were not people with degrees in social work. Department of Administrative Services that oversees job classification said you can't have someone doing the same job with two different job titles. Um, but that bill did make its way out of a committee, and it actually, I think, got as far as the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee... Uh, didn't do anything to let the bill die. The state of Connecticut had determined that it was going to cost a, a lot of money to do this, um, and the state has a tendency to do that. State agencies will attach fiscal notes to to uh, proposed legislation when they're when they're not in favor of things, and that's something that we'll talk about later. You know, in terms of some of the obstacles we'll we'll have to overcome. But the other reason that we never pursued the bill further until now is that I was always concerned that if we got the state to agree to change the title of social worker to, say, case manager or case worker, that the state would then not have any incentive to hire people with degrees in social work. So, so when, when the Malloy administration first came in about eight years ago, we actually embarked on a campaign, NESW embarked on a campaign, to get the state to hire real social workers for the job of social worker. And we were successful in doing that. The state now has to give preference in hiring to people with MSW and BSW degrees for the social worker job series. Um, once we accomplished that, I decided we still wanted to hold off on title protection. And the reason was I wanted to make sure that it really stuck, if you will. So now we're sitting here, we're talking about eight years later. The, the state has actually been giving preference for about six years, um, DCF and DSS, have been primarily hiring, if not solely hiring, people with social work degrees. We feel to a certain degree that we've institutionalized that. Um, so at this point, we feel it's time to take on title protection. Uh, we're no longer giving the state an out. They're already, we've already got in place the, uh, the preference for real social workers. So that's why we decided this is the time to, uh, to move forward. Okay, um, if you can go to the next slide. I lost my slide. 
Um, as we, as we talk about this, NESW um, is introducing a bill into the legislature to protect vulnerable consumers from receiving substandard services and ensuring only professionally trained social workers can hold the title of social worker. Um, to us, you know, the real point here is that when somebody calls themselves a social worker, they really should have a degree of social work. Um, Unfortunately, in Connecticut, there is no protection for the title of social worker, which means that anybody can call themselves a social worker. So if you are a consumer of services and you think you're seeing a social worker, you really have no way of knowing whether the social worker you're seeing um, is actually trained in social work or are they someone with a, a related or even an unrelated degree. So we decided, you know, this is definitely the time to move forward. Um, I can't think of any profession that would want to have a title that could be used by people who do not have a degree in social work. Um, so we're feeling, you know, if you look at that, can you imagine nurses saying, oh, yeah, anyone should call themselves a nurse, or doctors saying anyone should call themselves a doctor, or teachers saying anyone could be a teacher. Um, we have a degree. We had actually degrees, a BSW and MSW, as well as doctoral degrees in social work that has very specific training. And it's time that after over 100 years as a profession that we protect that title. If you could move to the next slide, please. Um, 31 states have title protection for job classifications for social workers. That includes Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, and New Jersey, and several other states, uh, including Rhode Island is working on it. 31 states out of the 50 states, so it's far more than the majority of states that already have title protection. The rest of the states are similar to, to um, Connecticut. Connecticut has partial title protection. When I say partial title protection, I mean that we cannot, you cannot call yourself a licensed social worker or use initials that imply that you're a licensed social worker, either LCSW or LMSW in the state of Connecticut. And pretty much every state has that. But that doesn't protect the consumer for those individuals who are practicing calling themselves a social worker. Clinical social work requires a social work degree, at least an MSW degree. However, there's many aspects of social work that do not require a license, including the, the various case management jobs that are out there. So, you know, we're very much feeling like after 31 states, we'd like to be the 32nd or the 33rd, depending if Rhode Island gets there before us. Um, we also want to point out that there's a lot of professions that already have title protection in Connecticut statute, and they include chiropractors, uh, electrologist, now this is an interesting one, electrologist. You cannot advertise that you are performing electrology if you are not licensed in a, as an electrologist. Um, another one of my favorites, massage therapist. You cannot call yourself a massage therapist if you are not licensed as a massage therapist. Occupational therapy and occupational therapy assistants, physical therapists and physical therapist assistants, Practical nurses and psychologists are amongst those who um, have title protection. Other professions have title protections, include, as this should be no surprise, um, dentists have title protection, physicians have title protection, veterinarians have title protection. So this is not something that is going to be a first in the state of Connecticut. It's something that already exists for a number of professions. The other thing that I think that's important about the different states is that legislators, for some reason, pay particular attention to what states surrounding us do and to what New England states are doing. So in New England, we have Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine that already have full title protection. Rhode Island came very close to passing a law last year. It died the last day of their session. We expect that they're going to probably get their bill through this year. You know, this could leave New Hampshire and Connecticut as the only two states in New England without title protection. Um, New York is similar to us. Their title protection 
is for licensed persons only, but New Jersey, so in the tri-state area, New Jersey has full title protection. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. So why protect the social work title? Um, there are a number of reasons why we would want to protect our title. And if we can quickly move to the next slide again, thank you. Um, first of all, we want to ensure that social workers are professionally trained and educated to work with diverse populations uh, by attaining a degree in social work that includes rigorous curriculum and cultural differences, ethical practice, human behavior, and therapeutic treatments. Um, individuals who did not hold a social work degree clearly do not have background in social work, they do not have the theoretical training in social work, do they not have the professional supervised internships that are required for social work. So it's very important um, <coughs> that if you are calling yourself a social worker, you be someone who actually has that training. And let's face it, it's not an easy degree to acquire. Um, both at the bachelor and master level, there's extensive curriculum. There is, I believe, 10 areas of that you have to, to meet in terms of uh, Connecticut uh, Council on Social Work Education. You need to have a professional internship. Uh, these are significant amounts of training that we bring to the table. And someone who does not have a um, degree in social work simply does not have that training. It's interesting that the state of Connecticut has a social worker series. And one of the requirements in that series is that you have um, skills and knowledge of social work, and we've always argued with the state that how do you meet that requirement if you do not have a degree in social work? You can go to the next slide. <coughs> to ensure that social workers are bound by the NESW Code of Ethics, this is a particularly important area. Consumers should know that when they're seeing somebody who calls himself a social worker, that that social worker is abiding by a professional code of ethics. And whether you're a member of NESW or not, you are bound by the NESW Code of Ethics because the state of Connecticut uses that Code of Ethics as a standard of practice. So if there was a complaint filed against a social worker um, with the Department of Public Health, they go to our Code of Ethics, whether or not that person's an NESW member. Now, if a consumer is seeing a social worker and that social worker does not have a degree in social work, then that, that social worker is not bound by the code of ethics. Um, and because they're not a professionally trained social worker, there's no place to go if you want to file a complaint against an individual unless you want to purchase, I mean, I'm sorry, unless you want to uh, contract or uh, seek of a, um, an attorney to go after someone in civil court. Not an option typically a client or consumer may have. So it's very important that when the public sees the title social worker, they know it means that somebody who has a code of ethics is, is abiding by that code of ethics, practicing under that code of ethics, and that under that code of ethics, the consumer, in fact, is protected in case there is a problem or, a, or a, an allegation made that the, that the social worker may have violated the professional code. We can move to the next slide. Social work to ensure social workers are held to strict confidentiality with their consumers. Now, this is an interesting point. There is a state law in Connecticut, a social work confidentiality statute. That statute comes into play basically by saying that records must remain confidential. And people often think it's the social worker who holds the confidentiality. In fact, it's really the consumer who holds the confidentiality. It's up to a consumer whether or not they want to allow their information to be released. Now, there are exemptions to that. For instance, we're mandated reporters, so we cannot hold confidential information related to uh, child abuse, elder abuse, uh, abuse related to disabilities. Um, there are times when we can release certain amounts of information that has to do with billing purposes. In a situation of an emergency, we have the right to release information to another provider in order to provide care for a client, but then we have to inform the client. But for the most part, consumers have the right to confidentiality. Now, this, only, this took effect in 1992. Before 1992, there was no confidentiality statute for social workers. 
excuse me, in Connecticut. In the statute, it does say that if the consumer believes that they are being treated by somebody who is a professional social worker, that the consumer can claim confidentiality of their record. Now, I do not know of anyone who's ever taken that to court and tried to, uh, to test that part of the language, but clearly, in my opinion, that's a very tentative argument. So by having people with the title of social worker without being a professional social worker, consumers are really putting their confidentiality at risk. Um, so that's another key reason, I think, that you, know, you need to have title protection so consumers are not going to be put in the position of having to test out language that says, well, I thought the person was a professional social worker. I didn't know they could release my information. Furthermore, if they're not a professional social worker, they very well not even know enough about confidentiality to understand when they should release information and when they're not allowed to release information. So there's a really significant risk, I think, to consumers by not having title protection when it relates to confidentiality. Uh, you can go to the, to the next slide. To ensure that individuals who lose their license in another state cannot practice in Connecticut. Without title protection, anyone can be called a social worker in Connecticut. So there's nothing to stop a worker who's harmed a consumer in another state to repeat that offense in Connecticut. So there is a, a database that the state of Connecticut can look into. So if you come in and you actually have a social work degree and you apply for licensure, the state can investigate and make sure that you have not, uh, you do not have any violations in another state, you haven't lost your license in another state, and the state in that case <coughs> could withhold the license. However, because anyone can call themselves a social worker, uh, or an, a social worker with a social work degree who lost their license in another state could come into Connecticut and still refer themselves as a social worker, as well as anybody else could come into Connecticut having perhaps been um, removed from a position in another state because of violations, and then come in, open some kind of practice, start you get hired, call themselves a social worker again. Consumers really have no protection because it's just very easy to use the title. And the reality is there's very little protections and oversight of the profession in Connecticut. So unless somebody comes forward and files a complaint with the Department of Public Health, there is no what I would call social work police out there. Um, sometimes people will contact NESW uh, and say they think somebody is practicing illegally, we will then report that to the state of Connecticut and ask them to look into it. But the fact is, it's very easy in Connecticut to practice without a license, and, it's, and obviously without a title protection law, anyone again calls themselves a social worker. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. To ensure that vulnerable consumers know they are getting exceptional social work services, <coughs> excuse me, misuse of the social work title is, first of all, a form of misrepresentation by the worker because the worker knows that they're not truly, or hopefully the worker knows they're not truly a social worker and that they understand that there's actually a degree that's required. Um, but it's also a, a misrepresentation by the employer. And in fact, I actually put much more onus upon the employer than I do the employee. I don't think there's a lot of people out there who are calling themselves a social worker without having been given that title by an employer. So our legislation is really aimed as much as at employers as it is individuals. By having title protection in statute, we can make sure that employers are not misusing the title. And if the employer is not giving the title wrongfully, then you don't have employees who are utilizing the title wrongfully. Um, for instance, an employer couldn't advertise social work services if they don't have somebody who's actually a social worker providing those services. Again, they can advertise other kinds of services, human services, social services, but they can't actually say social work services. So we think this is another key reason that we want to um, protect the title is to make sure that employers are not... Are not um, Give away our title. We can move to the next slide. 
as I think I noted earlier, other professions would not stand for the misuse of their title by a person with a substandard qualification. And I don't say substandard qualification lightly. The reality is that if you don't have a social work degree and you're practicing as a social worker, quote, unquote, you are actually substandard in terms of your qualifications. Um, so why should social work be any different than other professions? Um, individuals who have not attained certain formal training cannot refer to themselves as a member of most professions. Under existing laws, I said before, nursing, medicine, psychology, law, physical therapy, massage therapy, etc., all require the appropriate degree. So we think it's extremely important to us that we protect our title as a profession. And furthermore, individuals don't necessarily always see social work as a profession because we're probably a, a much misunderstood profession. Part of that, I think, has to do with the fact that social work is very broad in the, in the way that we uh, provide services. Uh, we don't have a narrow uh, focus. We, um, we have a very broad person and environment approach. And because social workers do so many different aspects of work and are in so many different employment settings, it's hard for people sometimes to understand what a social worker is. I think, you know, you talk about, you say a doctor, you know, there's all kinds of specialties, but people understand medicine. You say an attorney, people understand law. Um, by not protecting our title, we are continuing that problem and making that, continue to make that problem worse by allowing anyone to have that title. So really part of protecting the title is making sure that we are seen by the public as the professionals that we are. You can go to uh, the next slide. Okay, so we're, um, we're going to look now at the proposed language. Now, this proposed language, actually what we, we have up is one uh, variation of the statute, and actually we probably are not going to start with the language that is specifically in this slide. Uh, but this slide says that no person shall use the title social worker unless said person has attained a baccalaureate or master degree in social work from a Council on Social Work Education accredited program or a doctoral degree in social work. Persons using the title social worker without a degree in social work may be fined an amount not to exceed $250 in order to cease to use the title social worker until such time that they acquired a degree of social work as defined in this section, and this section means we're, this section means it's part. It's going to be in a statute in the, in the licensing statute is where we expect this language to be. So that's why it talks about a section. Uh, the commissioner of public health or their designated representative will be responsible for enforcement of this act. Now there is a final line here that talks about someone who was priorly employed as a social worker before this law takes effect. We're hoping this obviously law takes effect. We are not actually going to use that final sentence when we first introduce the bill. Um, and I will talk in a minute about some of the strategies, and at that point I'll talk further about why that's the case. But we do anticipate that that may be one of the things that we may need to give back at, at some point. If you um, can go to the next slide, the action plan. We're going to hold the action plan up, but there's a couple of things I do want to talk about before we, we get to that. Um, first of all, we know there's, we have allies and we have some eight folks we think are going to be hopefully neutral. I just want to touch on that. We're very pleased to say that uh, the Connecticut Psychiatric Society has indicated that they are in support of this concept. Uh, psychiatry has actually always been very uh, supportive of social workers. Uh, they've been supportive of us in third-party reimbursement back in nine, 1990. They supported us for licensure in 1995. Um, they were fine when we did a new licensing law for LMSW in 2000. Well, that law, I think, passed 2010. And when we went to the state and said that we wanted preference in hiring for so people with social work degrees, the uh, psychiatrists supported that. So we're very pleased to say that while they said they need to see the specific language of the bill, they're conceptually in support. Uh, NESW does the same thing. If a profession asks us for support, we always say conceptually we can support it, but it's always you got to always look at the language before you're sure. 
Um, we have talked to the Maryland family therapist, and we have talked to professional counselors. We have not gotten a re- direct response from them, and the same thing for psychologists. Our hope is that they will either be supportive or that they'll remain neutral. We have heard from um, SEIU 1199. That's, uh, they represent a lot of the state state workers. They, they represent clinical work social workers, the state clinical social work series. 1199 is fine with this bill. So we do know that, you know, we have support. We have seven uh, MSW legislators. This is the most um, social work legislators we've ever had. All of them are in support of this bill. We have the support of um, the Human Services Co-Chair, uh, Human Services Committee, uh, Catherine Abercrombie, who is one of the people who will introduce a bill for us. Um, so we know there's folks out there who are going to support us. We have talked to the Department of Public Health. Um, we're going to continue to have conversations with DPH. They, I don't think they really at this point understand fully the necessity of this bill, um, so we're going to continue to work with them. We need to still talk to the Department of Administrative Services who under, oversees personnel issues. So we, you know, we're hoping, again, that there will either be support or neutrality from these groups. We do not know how the state employee union uh, that represents social workers, where they will stand on this. One of the things we do know, though, that given their opposition in the past, that they're going to have some concerns. Um, it is possible that we may have to waive in some of their um, employees, which is that language that we are not starting with, but that may be a concession. When we did licensing in 1995, we give the state of Connecticut an extra year to come into compliance. That may be a concession, but we surely will be working with the state and with the state union um, and we're going to remind them that more and more of the social workers being hired by the state of Connecticut have social work degrees. So the union, the state public employee union, their membership demographics is changing, and it would surely be to their advantage to, um, to be minimally neutral, if not supportive, given the fact that increasingly their membership is going to be social workers. And because of a Supreme Court decision, individuals no longer have to be a member of their union. So we're hoping that those, that will go a long way when talking with, with the union folks. Um, now we're going to let me talk a little bit about um, oh, one more thing about opponents, and that is people sometimes come out of the woodwork that you wouldn't expect. So when we introduce the bill, people may come forward who have the title of social worker, not the degree, who truly believe that they are a social worker. So I think that's, you know, one other potential area that we need to, might be an obstacle. And the other obstacle is that legislators typically don't know very much of anything about social work beyond our seven social work legislators. And um, we have a lot of education that needs to be done so uh, to make so, uh, legislators understand why this is important. So now we're going to get to um, our action plan. Our action plan to put it succinctly, is mobilization, mobilization, mobilization. We need to get a quick start on this bill. In 1990, we did a third-party vendorship, they call it, a third-party reimbursement. In 1990, the insurance industry opposed social workers getting third-party reimbursement. Now, if you think the insurance industry has influence in Hartford, now, in 1990, we truly were the capital of insurance in the world. We beat the insurance industry because we got off to a fast start. The insurance industry never thought a bunch of social workers would get anywhere. And about three, four weeks into the session, they began to get nervous, and they never caught up. That's the, basically the strategy. We need a fast start. We need to contact every legislator right off the bat. We need to start calling and, and emailing as soon as we have bill numbers. We need to do it in the beginning of session. We need to do it in the middle of session. We need to do it in the end of session. Legislators listen to constituents, and we have constituents in every single legislative district. We also have people who are not members of NESW who are social workers. There's actually approximately 9,000 social workers who are licensed in the state of Connecticut. We have the numbers to push this through. We're going to be meeting with key legislators. We've already begun to set up appointments to meet with the chairs of the committee or committees that this bill will go to. 
We know the committee of bill would probably go to the Public Health Committee. Uh, Representative Jonathan Steinberg from Westport is the House Chair. Um, Senator Mary Abrams, brand new state senator from Meriden, um, is going to be the Senate Chair. We're going to um, be meeting with the co-chairs, and we're going to be meeting with the ranking members, which means the lead Republicans on that committee. And then we'll start setting up meetings of all the members of the committee. An interesting twist is, though, that is that Representative Catherine Abercrombie, also from Meriden, who chairs the Human Services Committee, is introducing one of the individuals introducing a bill, wants to also run a bill in her committee, Human Services. So there's a good possibility bills will come up in two committees. So we will be working with Representative Abercrombie and also with uh, Senator Marilyn Moore, who is the Senate Chair of Human Services. We are very excited about having the two committees. There's actually a lot of support, I think, from both committees. But we will be half asking our members who have representatives and senators on that committee, we'll be asking our members to contact their legislators as soon as we have bill numbers and it goes to a committee. So we'll be sending emails out to our members who live in those districts. We'll be following up with phone calls to our members who live in those districts. And as the bill goes from one committee to another, we follow the bill with exactly the same steps, sending out emails and making follow-up phone calls to individuals um, who have members who are, have constituents in those committees. Uh, we're meeting, we'll be meeting with DPH and other agencies as we need to. We're going to be sending out an email alert. Again, as soon as you have a bill number, it could be today. If not, very early next week we'll have bill numbers. Uh, we're going to send an email alert out to all of our members. We're also going to send an email alert out to everyone who's licensed, because we have that list, and we also have a list of all the school social workers in Connecticut. So we're going to be sending out, all together we're probably sending out about twelve to 14,000 emails um, to folks. And then we're doing something that we have not normally done. We are doing a hard mail, hard copy mailing to all of our members, because we know not everybody opens emails. We know that maybe 30 to 40 percent of our members open our emails within the first few days, which is actually a very high open rate. Um, but we're going to be sending a hard copy email, a uh, hard copy mailing to all our members with our fact sheet and with a map that shows the 31 states, a map that we're also going to use with legislators. Finally, next week, we're going to do a literature drop. We're going to take our fact sheets and our map with a cover letter, and we're going to send it to every single legislator is going to get it through their, in their mail. Um, internal mail system at the legislature. So every legislator is going to have this information. If you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, how you can make title protection a reality. This is really where those of you who are listening come into play, and this is where our members and our non-members and our friends and family and our supporters all come into play. You know, it doesn't have to be a social worker making calls and contacts with legislators. We're going to ask people to talk to colleagues. We're going to ask them to talk to family members. We're going to ask you to talk to friends and even clients. If you have a client who you feel that you can have that conversation with, there's nothing more powerful than a client calling and saying, you know, I'm being treated by someone with a social work degree, and it's important to me that I know that that person's a real social worker. So the first thing people can do, and the most important thing, is to contact their state legislators. I can't emphasize that enough. The legislators will listen. We can overcome opposition if there is enough contact by constituents, because that derives the bills. The reality is that legislators know that they're there because someone's elected them. And if they don't do what their constituents need, that they may not get reelected. Uh, we have a lot of new legislators who probably are not even used to being lobbied, and if we have a large response to those new legislators, I think that will be very powerful. Secondly, recruiting your colleagues, friends, and family <coughs> to contact their legislators. Again, it doesn't have to be just social workers, and in fact, if legislators hear from non-social workers, that could actually be very, very effective because it doesn't look like it's just, of course, the profession is going to say this, but why would non-social workers also agree? That was one of the ways we got preference in hiring um, in the, for the state, is we had non-social work organizations supporting us. Join a phone bank. 
we need to call our members as the bill moves from committee to committee. These are really easy and friendly calls. This isn't like you're calling strangers. You're going to be calling NESW members and saying, did you get the legislative alert in the email? Have you contacted your legislator? Do you need any information? And then you ask them to make the call or send the email to their legislator. They're easy calls. They're friendly calls, but there's a lot of them. Um, we do have a couple of interns, but I would like my interns to do something else this semester other than just phone calling. Seriously, we need people to help us make phone calls. If you can make eight or ten phone calls, that would be a huge success and help to us. You can do it in your own time. You can do it at the chapter office. We can send you a list. But that's really important. Uh, you can donate to NESW Connecticut. We have an advocacy fund. It's actually going to cost somewhere between twenty-eight and $30,000 to introduce this bill. Um, a significant portion of that is that we've hired Gallo and Robinson. Uh, they are lobbyists. They've, they've actually helped us with lobbying in the past. They are one of the most respected lobbying firms up at the Capitol. They have been doing this for over 30 years, maybe 40 years. Um, we have four lobbyists that work for them that are working for us, but a significant cost of that 28 to 30000 is going to be uh, the cost of our professional lobbyists. And then there's cost to us in terms of our mailings. There's cost to us in terms of staff time. We need to raise money. Now, Connecticut NESW has been saving money for quite a few years now. We've been putting money aside, but we do need to raise some more money. If we could raise $10,000, that would be a huge help. So if anyone can make a contribution of any amount to NESW Connecticut, you can go to our website, uh, neswct.org, and click on Donate. Or you can make a check payable to NESW Connecticut and put advocacy fund in the memo section and send it to us. Um, finally, if you're not a member of NESW, joining NESW is a wonderful way to help us. Um, half of your dues will come back to the chapter, it helps fund our operations, and then we can easily, much easier, reach you. That's my full presentation. I, I'd like to open it up now to uh, anyone who may have a question. Hi, uh, I am going to read some questions that were submitted online. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that presentation. Very informative. And uh, one of our listeners wants to know that uh, they are an LCSW, and why should they care about title protection since their license already protects them? Okay, so your license protects the title, but it doesn't truly protect you fully. Um, consumers should still need to know that they are seeing someone who's an LCSW or LMSW. They need to see someone who's really a social worker. And the fact is that title protection makes it possible for the public to see us as a profession. And while we'd like to, we all feel we're a profession, as long as there's people out there who are not professional social workers and are practicing and are not necessarily practicing in a way that is Good practice, it reflects on everybody. So it reflects on the LCSWs negatively and it reflects on the LMSWs negatively. So it's really a matter of do we care about the consumer? Um, do we care about our professional name? And, yes, it's wonderful when you're licensed and it's wonderful that you're, you were protected, that no one can say they're a licensed social worker. But it doesn't go far enough because we need the public to know that when they're seeing a social worker, they're seeing a social worker. Thank you for that question. Great. Thank you. Um, another one, Steve. Have other behavioral health professions gotten title protection, and if so, how? What was their process? So in Connecticut, psychologists are the only behavioral health profession that has title protection. Well, psychiatry does, but they have it through physician title protection. Psychology to the best of our knowledge, was able to include it in their statute when they became licensed. So they did not have to, to the best of our knowledge, they did not have to go through a separate, um, a separate bill. There's no other behavioral health professions in Connecticut that currently have their title protected. I am sure if we are successful that the other behavioral health professions would probably want to follow suit. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Trailblazers. Um, <clears throat> are there any costs 
associated with this change? We don't think it should be a cost. Um, the state of Connecticut may determine there's some cost involved. I mean, Department of Public Health would be asked to enforce this legislation. We don't really anticipate it's going to take a lot of enforcement. We anticipate that when employers learn about this, that they're going to follow the statute and make the necessary changes. The state of Connecticut, if they have to change the title of social worker to something else, I mean, technically I suppose there could be some cost to that. We're hoping if that's the case that it would not be a significant cost. But for employers, we don't see any cost to employers, um, to private profit. I mean, the private employers, nonprofit employers, there shouldn't really be any cost involved. Okay, um, another one just came in. Do you feel that more companies will hire MSWs? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yes, I'm sorry. Do you feel that more companies will hire LMSWs? With we them? do. I, I think that um, one of the potential benefits here is that if employers see that they have to use the title social worker only for people with social work degrees, I think it heightens our value. And I think if it heightens our value, that employers may be more likely to hire the, the individual with a social work degree than someone without a social work degree. So I think there is that potential for some real benefit as employers begin to f better understand that there's a difference between just having someone with a title versus having someone with a degree. So I think, yeah, I think it really can um, uh, have a ripple effect in terms of jobs. Great. Um, I know you discussed some barriers, but could you go over them again, some of the barriers you foresee in passing this legislation and maybe like the points along the process so we have a better better idea of what we can do to help? <clears throat> okay, so some of the barriers that we see, uh, first of all, Department of Public Health needs to have an understanding that there really is a need and then that we need to to, to work with them so they don't feel like they need another staff person in order to enforce this. I mean, our guess is that it's very rare that they ever have to enforce psychology. So that's one barrier is working with the Department of Public Health. Another barrier, is, and that's really, I think, just meeting with the TPH. And um, our other strategy, actually I didn't mention, is that we are going to have a meeting with Lieutenant Governor uh, Susan Beisowitz, who is very uh, favorable towards social work. And we're hoping the Vermont administration is supportive of this, and then, then that support will flow down to the commissioners. Uh, there is not, we don't know who the commissioner will be for the Department of Public Health. Also, Commissioner Department of Administrative Services, that's, if the state has to change the job title, um, that's something that, again, I think some of our strategy is, I think, to put some pressure on the Vermont administration to understand this importance. Legislators don't know a lot about social work, so that can be an obstacle. The fact sheet that we're giving the legislators is two-sided. We normally don't do fact sheets by more than one side because they tend not to read them. But this is a two-sided fact sheet. The first side talks about all the reasons that we need title protection. The back side talks about what social workers do, where we work, what our training is, um, who we are. And so one obstacle is just helping legislators understand that we're a profession and why I think that's important. Um, and then again, people just may come out of the woodwork who, who think they're a social worker because their employer has, um, has given them a, that, that title. The ways around that, again, is really lobbying legislators, having our lobbyists work closely up at the Capitol and having people contacting legislators and asking them to support the bill. So we understand, you know, if you're a licensed social worker, you may say, well, does this really affect me? But the reality is that as long as anyone can call himself a social worker, it, it diminishes our profession, whether we're licensed or not. So I think our biggest strategy is going to be that lobbying effort. So as the bill moves forward, NESW will be contacting people and saying, okay, in your, your legislators on the public health committee, your legislators on human services, your legislators um, maybe in appropriations, you need to contact them. The bill will eventually, we hope, get to the House and the Senate. If we don't know whether we'll go to the Senate or the House first, we don't know that as of yet. There'll probably be seven bills introduced. Um, they'll probably combine them into one bill. 
And then if it goes to the Senate, then we have to contact all our members and, and have all the senators lobbied. And if it goes to the House first, then you want to lobby all the House. Either way, you eventually have to lobby every legislator. And again, that means phone calls and emails. And um, we expect some of the schools and social work will do lobby days. And we encourage people to come up. There's going to be a public hearing. Whenever they raise a bill, they have to have a public hearing. So it will be important for us to have probably three or four people come and speak, somebody who's an educator who can talk about what social work education is. Um, NESW will come up and speak. And then we're hoping to have a couple of practitioners can come up and speak. Um, because if you don't show up for a public hearing, then they don't think you care about the bill. So um, that's another strategy that we'll be we'll be working on. Great, thank you. Um, another question came in. Will you post the fact sheet under the materials tab of this presentation? Um, I, I can do that and post that, Steve, as long as I get that fact sheet from you. Sure, we'll be glad to send that. We'll send the map and we can send some of our other materials. It's also getting posted on our website too, nsdct.org. If you click on advocacy, there's a drop down, and one of the drop downs says title protection. And then if you hit title protection, the fact sheet comes up. And then there's another drop down off of that, which has other documents. So we'll send it to you so the Women's Consortium can have it. And um, we'll also have it, we already have it on our website. Okay. Uh... Let me just give another call out to anybody that is uh, on online with the webinar. If there's any more questions here for Steve, okay. And as Steve just indicated, there is the uh, naswct.org website. You can submit any questions there too. But the materials are also available. Um, I will upload this to the materials tab and also have it available uh, to anybody who has signed in. I will email it to you. Um, Steve, I'd like to, and Michelle, I'd like to thank you for your time. If there's anything else you want to add in. I just want to say to folks, you know, if you're a social worker, you should take pride in that fact. And part of that pride should be taking action to make sure that individuals who don't have your training can't call themselves a social worker. So whether you're a licensed social worker or not, you should really be concerned about that fact that folks are out there using our title. Anyway, and thank, I would folks just so thank everyone. And to say thank you so much for your support, and we look forward to continuing to represent social work in Connecticut to the best of our ability and to continue to be really strong advocates for our profession and for the people that we work with and serve. Wonderful. I want to thank you both for our uh, for a very informative. Uh, I do feel proud to uh, be on my path to becoming a social worker, and, and can't wait to actually call myself one uh, when I get my degree in May. So thank you both for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and on behalf of Connecticut Women's Consortium, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for the participation, and also like to thank Michelle and Steve for the excellent presentation. And again, thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope you all have a great day.